Hello, I'm George Liston, CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. The storyteller's art is central to our human experience. From the campfire to the lecture hall, the dinner table to the stage hall, we understand our world through the stories we tell about it. And that is true of all subjects and all peoples in all times. Consider, for example, the ancient themes of Africa, humanity's birthplace, and the very modern topic of sustainable development. These two currents combine to form a powerful cautionary tale, a parable for our time, giving an opportunity to relive ancient rhythms and recommit modern energies to the solution of an acute challenge in this brave new world of globalization. My guest is Jesse Ribot, Senior Associate in the Institutions and Governance Program of the World Resources Institute, and currently a Fellow of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Jesse, welcome to Dialogue. Thank you, George. Jesse, I'm going to tell our viewers they're in for a special treat because this is a, a groundbreaking a combination, if you will, of the art of performance and the art of conversation. We're going to enjoy watching you, actually, um, you and I watching you and the viewers as well, as you perform your poem, Ode to the Lorax. And uh, it also has with it some very intriguing uh, additional points. That is to say, the illustrations were commissioned by you, I think, from a Senegalese artist. And the music that's going to uh, play with this is composed by your brother, Mark Rebo. So this is kind of Rebo Productions in collaboration with Dialogue. Uh, Jesse, as we turn to this um, very entertaining and gripping explanation, presentation of a very serious topic, the first question is obvious. Why did you decide to do it this way, to combine these elements to use the poem? It's a funny story in itself. Back in 1996-97, I was writing on the history of forestry and forestry policy in West Africa. And as I was trying to tell this story, I kept feeling that the story was too absurd to be told in a serious fashion. It was a story about a problem, deforestation, uh, shortages of gum arabic, which is coming from the acacia tree in West Africa. Uh, yet, in fact, those shortages didn't really exist, mm. and the deforestation itself was not all that, uh, in fact, it wasn't measurable at the time. Right. And the people who thought there was deforestation were wrong. So it was a problem that didn't exist. But then if you looked at the solutions that had been proposed to solve the problem, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have fixed the problem. Mm. But in fact, the solutions were never really applied as they were designed. The policies were never really applied as designed. So even if they were uh, designed well mm -hmm. and the problem did exist, they wouldn't have <laughs> achieved their right. objective. So. Basically, it was a situation that if you tried to write about it, mm -hmm. as it was, would seem almost Mickey Mouse and strange. So I'm getting the sense that uh, because you wanted people to imagine a forthcoming reality, you used the power of imagination in this artistic form to bring them in. Well, it, it was even funnier than that in that I was sitting there trying to write the story and make it serious and put the pieces together, mm -hmm. and I thought this is more like a Dr. Seuss story uh -huh. than an academic piece of historical research. And I began writing. I literally, at that moment, began writing, and in two hours, the entire piece was on paper. This is it marvelous. Was, it it <laughs> spilled out of my pen mm -hmm. uh, like that, and I'd never done anything before and haven't done anything like it since. May I say that is an irresistible invitation to watch this uh, product of creativity, and it's probably also very reassuring for people to see a scholar who also has this, a strong artistic bent and an ability to bring imagination into the way he presents his stuff. Mm. So with that introduction, let's uh, look at the opening lines of The Business of Sustainable Development, an African Forest Tale. Way back in the days of pre-colonial bliss, when primordial forests were covered with mist, wood-dwelling natives ate nuts, berries, and bees, and picked monkey bread pods from the baobab trees. One glorious morning, 
Abdu Jalu and Jai, was harpooning dogfish and eating them fried, when he noted a speck sailing in from the sea. It was Captain Lusitania's friend Jelly McGee, with a flag, a cigar, and a beard full of fleas. Stepping out of his dingboat onto the beach, he cordially introduced himself with spectperfluous speech. He waved and he bowed, and then he announced, Bark doodleus cruncus, et fribulus sneeze, by dint of my foot, please give me a piece. It's marvelous, Jesse. You know, uh, I'm going to focus on that concluding line, by dint of my foot, please give me a piece in just a moment. But let me ask you this obvious first question, Jesse, and I think we're off to a great start. I can't imagine anyone who's not gripped right now by this. Who did the paintings, and how did you uh, conceive the, these kinds of paintings? The artist's name is Morgay, and he is a fairly well-known, uh, internationally known, what's called reverse glass painter. He paints on the back of panes of glass, and you see the image through the front. So he's painting in a mirror image, but also he's putting down the lines that a normal artist would have to put down last, the eyebrows and things of that sort, first. So he works from the surface backward, as it were. Uh, and Morgay lives in Dakar. Uh, he's a very religious man. Uh, he follows a uh, Sufi leader named Sheikh Amadou Bamba, mm. and his art, most of his life, has been dedicated to painting images of the history mm -hmm. of Sheikh Amadou Bamba's life. You know, um, his, his work is absolutely gorgeous. And I was struck by the concluding image that we saw of the uh, arriving colonist, I guess we would call him, mm -hmm. for putting his foot literally on the ground in that uh, magnificent sort of white tropical uniform. Um, when you had these pieces conceived and, and, and commissioned, were you seeking elements in each one that would kind of give points of emphasis to what you were saying, the points you wanted your audience to take away from? Absolutely. Um, I talked with Morgay about the story, uh, and then I went through the story with him uh, frame by frame, and I talked to him about where I wanted people, how I wanted them to be standing, who was doing the talking, mm. uh, how many boats, but I did not say anything about any stylistic aspects. And so Moore basically brought to it the sensibility mm -hmm. of the context in Senegal, the sense of the history and place and the different kinds of objects in the scene. But I just wanted to have him, uh, I, I just gave him an outline of the action and the actors. Right. Well, that sounds to me like an ideal collaboration because his, his artistic imagination was thus freed as well to, to contribute. Let me ask you a question. Going back to that, by dent of my foot, please mm -hmm. give me a piece. That clearly relates to the colonizer we saw stepping ashore. Absolutely. Is it also Jesse Ribot's uh, attitude about or, con or concern about the 21st century corporation? coming ashore. Is that the same? Is, are we seeing a repeat of that same sort of arrogance, if you will? We are. We are. But it, it's not necessarily only the 20th century or 21st century corporation. It's also uh, international donors and other groups who come to do good, to help, uh, to produce business, whatever they're going to be doing, mm -hmm. who end up in a situation where they come and have certain expectations about what they're able to take away. They have expectations about what is owned and what isn't owned, mm -hmm. what is available for commercialization and what is not, right. and who they should interact with. And they impose those. And by the fact, it, by dint, the power of his foot, mm -hmm. his foot's pretty big. Yeah. He comes with a lot of power behind him, this colonizing right. uh, captain. And that's true of almost anybody who comes from Europe mm -hmm. or North America to work in Africa. They come, even if they don't know it, with a lot of leverage and a lot of power that other people uh, will right. respond to. Uh, I'm very glad you made that point. And it makes me glad that I said this is the cautionary tale, because the use of power is, is I think, one of mm -hmm. your concerns and cautions. Let's continue with this story. Abdu consulted friends, mothers, and chiefs, offering the captain a well-shaded seat on the branch of a fruit-laden smorgasbord tree with the view of the forest, the village, and the sea. 
But then, off sailed the captain, waving his hat. He was back in a fortnight with five boats at that. McFilch and O'Pillage set up their camp, smack dab in the village by kerosene lamp. Cousins Extracto and Bernard de Corvée built rows of square houses in less than a day, trading green widgets for fruits on long trays. Extracto and Corvée soon started their work when they pulled out tree snippers, hack hackers and yurks. They were met eye to eye by incredulous chiefs with oddball requests and illogical beefs. Please, said one chief, with a sad, twisted smile, your cutting is stretching for over a mile. These forests provide us with edible sap and cowberry fruits, not to mention the spirits that live in their roots. Once again, that's great. I've got a comment on the names. McFilch, O'Pillage, and Extracto. Anyone who doesn't get the point, I think. Uh, well, there's also uh, Corvée is another one. Corvée meaning forced labor. Mm -hmm. um, let me also say, though, in that, in that segment, I was deeply struck by the chief's lament. And uh, here it is right in front of me. These forests provide us with edible sap, not to mention the spirits that live in their roots. And I finally, I, I, not finally, but I sort of thought of that as kind of the crux of the dissonance between what people living there felt about what they had and what those who were coming, McGilch, right. et cetera, take That's away right. From. There's a cultural, historical embeddedness, attachment to the forest, to the place where people live. It doesn't mean that those people are natural or to be naturalized and associated with nature as if uh, the distinction between nature and culture is what needs to reign and which is what the colonists often right. saw. But what it means is that somebody coming from the outside may see these as natural resources where they're still imbued with numerous meanings for somebody who lives nearby. Right. I was also struck by the ox, I think, that appears in the background. Yeah, it's a, th that's the illogical beef. And that's what I thought was that's the, right. that also the Lorax? His, no, that's not from the Lorax. Uh, when he says uh, uh, the chiefs come with their illogical beefs, you know, complaints that don't make sense, I thought, well, I'll represent an illogical beef here. And I asked Morgay <laughs> to put down a cow that had crossed horns and looked uh -huh. a little bit crazy. So that's what you got. That's the illogical that's beef. That's what you got. But there's actually, there's so many layers of things going on in yeah. there. As you go from image to image, well, you can, we'll, we can pull some of that out as we go. But the smorgasbord tree mm -hmm. represents the fact that these forests have multiple uses mm -hmm. to people. The tree is used for its bark, its roots, its uh, branches, its wood, its firewood. It's used for food, for fodder, for medicine, uh, medicinal purposes, and what have you. Right. So the forest has a lot of importance to people, and you know each of the images has that kind of multiple meaning Absolutely. within it, well, I wherever say, I could construct it. Indeed, and I would say these are scenes not just to be looked at, but to be deeply looked at, almost studied, I mean, to get, to get the full impact. Let's go on with it. I love now, I guess we're going to hear the next segment, the response, if you will, to the chief's lament about this misuse of uh, native resources. But then barked McGee, our work does no harm. It's your very own cutting that's cause for alarm. Why cutting in chaos for your housing and fuel? Waste such valuable wood we could sell in old Liverpool. Why, if you keep using forests for your insatiable needs, how will we ever supply Europe with thneeds? A thneed? A thneed? A thneed is a thing. A thing, that is, with just so many uses. It can serve as a coffin for great northern mooses. It can serve as a bench or a box to hold snuff or a stylish stand for a fine coffee cup. Can't you see, said McGee? I come with a vision. We'll cut down the forest from here to Mount Mission. We'll rotate them by decades and watch them grow back so they'll always be forests for continuous hack hack. Sustainability, we'll call it, he said. 
There'll be eternal growth from now till we're dead. The whole lovely thing will take place in straight lines, and it's assured to work smoothly due to exorbitant fines. The best for the most, and the most for the best. Mostly me, he then mumbled, and jobs for the rest. It's marvelous again. Uh, you're on a roll, Jesse, with this poem. Let me, let me, I, uh, we, the time does not permit us to do all that we should be doing with all the things that we're seeing. But I've got to ask you one question I'd love to hear you comment on, and that's thneed. That's, a, that's a mar the, the word thneed. It, it seems to me that's a comment on patterns of consumption as well as everything else. Absolutely. It's directly borrowed from Dr. Seuss's book, The Lorax. And a thneed, he describes, is a thing that everybody needs. So thing and need becomes thneed. Mm -hmm. It's about consumerism and capitalism. And a lot of things that sounded pretty useless and, and fr frivolous, actually, but yeah. uh, that would be, and, and I think the point of this is that would be what they want to use the forest for. That's right. And things that to someone local mm -hmm. uh, look that absurd, mm -hmm. and yet they're being depicted as so important yeah. by yeah. the captain. Yeah. I have a vision. We'll cut down the forest from here to Mount Mission. And so it, it, it just shows the distinction between the discourse of what the captain is saying and the actual reality of the practice right. and how stark and absurd it is. And that actual reality of the practice extends to the quote and um, jobs for everyone or what is the, the exact? And jobs for the rest. And jobs for the rest, which sound like maybe no jobs at all. Really. I mean, no real jobs in the well, sense of well, what they could be. It, it actually, there often are jobs. Mm. And one of the problems that happens is you get everything um, in the colonial period as well as under many of the participatory development schemes you see today these schemes create ways for people to participate. They're right. participating, though, in somebody else's project. Rather than and they their participate own. not as decision makers, but as mm -hmm. labor. And this is the point we're going to see in our next segment, because I think the chief's response is going to drive that home. And that's exactly. It. See it right now. Yes, said the chief, I can see with your eyes. Have you ever considered selling cola nut pies or tradable permits for black clouds in the sky? Why, your work leaves our village in a sea of new stumps. We don't even have places to hide rubbish dumps. The rains won't come without forests around, and your rotational methods drive our young out of town. We have bellies to fill and spirits to feed, so please, Take leave of this place with your yurks in good speed. But if, Quip McGee, you use trees just to survive, why, the thneeds of all nations will be cruelly deprived. Don't use them for fodder or your daily fuel. In the life of your nation, play your role as a tool, for supporting the national good is the rule. Look, here in the rule book, which you must obey, you have rights to the things that we don't take away, but we can't take the wood without taking the trees. So you'll have to make do with the stumps and some seeds. You can grow village woodlots, eucalyptus or pine. We'll help you to manage them through incentives and fines. If you listen, look, learn, and do as we say, even democratization will be on its way. We must protect forests from people like you so that people with business will have business to do. I think we've reached the crux of our drama here. Um, it's interesting to see the outsiders define the national good, um, and it's uh, uh, very interesting to talk them to talk about the rule book, which sounds like an internationally imposed rule book. Um, and then finally, it, it, this segment of the poem, and the poem in, in the context of the poem, raises questions, questions about, quote, democratization, and what people mean by it, and I know, I know that's what you study. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is what I work on. And uh, unfortunately, as he says in the end, so that people with business will have business to do, almost all of the interventions privilege the outsider and the business perspective, the extractive industries. And I work mostly in forestry, where you see a participatory forestry project in which people are supposedly going to get more of a say in how their forest is used. So they get to make a big management plan and work. Uh, in the, uh, and manage that forest. But in the end, if a corporation wants to come in, that corporation barely has to do anything, doesn't even have to do a management plan, mm -hmm. and gets to take the timber. Whereas if villagers want 
to control the forests around them, they have to elaborate co uh, very complex management plans in a kind of double standard that exists between these kind of um, very, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure how to put it, but the, they justify the the extractive industries in these global need and, and uh, what have you terms, whereas the subsistence and local use becomes the thing that is being said to destroy the forest. Mm -hmm. They have to have the management plan, and yet the actual destruction is coming from the outside. Yeah. Now, the democracy link here is very important. In the last decade, there has been a big move, after many years of participatory projects, towards what's called decentralization, democratic decentralization, where many of these local decisions would be taken under democratic local government, the establishment of democratic elected local authorities. And in that, I've been trying to look at the degree to which those authorities are actually gaining some control, some say, over the resources that surround the communities that they ostensibly represent. Mm. And that is, uh, that is a big part of the work I'm now doing. And unfortunately, what you're finding, or what we're finding in uh, more than 15 countries, is that even when they're given control over the resource, it is so totally subsumed under the supervision of a forestry service that there's almost no decision left for local people. They have to follow the rule book, as it were, now of the domestic forest service that basically privileges extractive industries right. and commercial uses over subsistence, even when the local population wants to right. uh, conserve the forest. You know, I think you're bringing us a tale, Jesse, not just from Africa and not just from the other side of the Atlantic, but from the other side of globalization, which I think is useful for all of us here to be considering. Um, and let's go to the conclusion of our tale okay. now and, and see just what this... Uh, the main point should be the main moral of our story. Abdu and the chiefs puzzled looks at each other when they heard the wise voice of Abdu's first mother. She said, I can remember the first time you came. You said something totally different, but you did just the same. This time it is I who will lay out the rules. You must stop hogging access to markets and tools. Why, the woods of my vision are a patchwork so fine, with trees giving lumber and rope-making vines. We'll grow great stately egg trees and bee trees with honey. We'll grow purple zump fruit and we'll sell some for money. And when it's time for the harvest, we'll dance the night through. Eating crumpets McFoo-Foo, we may even invite you. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and as we come to the end, Jesse, and, and uh, close to the end of our own conversation here, I'm moved by a lot of things, a lot of things in this, uh, in this poem and, and the lesson it teaches. And at the end here, we see in uh, the wise first mother's uh, observations uh, an emphasis on local needs, and I love the end, we'll invite you, rather than be That's right. essentially taken over by you. Trying to turn it around. The obvious question, Jesse, and it's a very big one, but even just uh, briefly stated, um, what are the correct principles of sustainable, uh, sustainable development, and how would they be reflected in, in the kind of decentralization, meaningful decentralization you would like to see in developing countries? I think that there are no correct principles of sustainable development per se. It's very context specific. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to the natural resource question, that is destruction or maintenance of natural resources that all of us depend on to some degree, mm -hmm. there are going to be some decisions that must be made at a higher scale. Mm -hmm. There are some national level values that need to be protected, whether it be at a scale of watersheds or right. gl even global values like carbon sequestration. But there are also a number of things that can be done at the local level, decisions that can be taken locally that don't threaten any of those higher level values. And those we should try and outline and understand what they are and devolve power to decide over those different things. Things as simple as if 
The higher level values mm -hmm. determine that one can extract timber from this area. Now, nobody can tell me that it isn't, it can't be a local decision mm -hmm. as to who gets to extract it. That's not an ecological decision, that's a political decision. So the ecology has already been, uh, the ecological question has already been parsed at a higher level. Right. But then the question of who gets to benefit from it. And then in terms of once one decides that you can do some cutting here, to let villagers, let local communities decide whether or not there's going to be cutting. So because just because you can doesn't mean you have to. And many communities don't want to. But in fact, the higher level authorities want commercial production for a variety of yeah. uh, uh, reasons. My sense of this would be, in shorthand, that you're talking about dialogue rather than dictation. That's right. And the devolution of as much power and authority as can be given to local communities to determine That's right. their outcomes. Th there's a principle called the principle of subsidiarity, which basically says you can make decisions at the lowest level possible when those decisions do not have negative effects for higher scales of social, political, and economic organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that itself is subject to many levels of discussion, debate, and interpretation. And I hope we get more and more of that from you, Jesse Rebo, in this way and other ways, in books and poems and everything you do. And thank you for being with us today on Dialogue. Thank you very, very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. All of ours. All our pleasure. Thank you. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments. And you can reach us at Dialogue at www.ic.si.edu. I'm George Liston C.A., and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Please join us again right here next week, and thank you for watching. Next week on Dialogue... Brian and I then talked about doing a book. It was Brian's idea. He said, let's develop this into a proper book. We then said we became ambitious. We said, let's get... 30 of the top people in the world and let's see what they have to make of the world we are living in. Mm -hmm. It's very pessimistic as it looks. Remember this is going back a few years. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be the clash of civilizations or is there some hope? Mm 